Hey, it's Wayne Williams speaking of horses. We're at the Indiana Equine Roundup. Today we're visiting with Ben's Ranch Foundation, a great cause. We'll hear that right after this. Nutrition is my passion. My formulas come from over 50 years of experience. Every product contains my unique blend of micronutrients. My focus is health from the inside out. Hey, it's Wayne Williams speaking of horses. We're here at the Indiana Equine Roundup. We're in uh, actually west of Indianapolis, Cloverdale, Indiana. Nice arena here. And the Indiana Equine Roundup is uh, in its third year. And uh, Rose McVeigh is my guest. I got that right, right? Yes, sir. All good, right. To, good to see you. And it, here. Good to see you. And it's Ben's Ranch Foundation. And, and you've got a story with Ben's Ranch Foundation and what you're trying to do to help and assist kids. So tell us, give us an update. We haven't talked for a couple of years on camera. Where are you right now? Well, you know, our work seems tediously slow, but we're growing here in central Indiana. And then we're beginning now to speak with schools and with communities about a new approach that hopefully will set the stage to really be able to serve kids anywhere, especially across all of Indiana. And for those who have never heard of us, you know, um, Ben was my oldest son, and I lost him after about a decade-long battle with mental health issues. And so basically right now, Wayne, we are creating internships or part-time jobs on farms, at stables, for kids that meet that description. Um, and when we can get them out there in a barn or, or you know, with a paintbrush in their hand or a, or a curry comb, uh, they start to bloom. And so we really want to also send that message around so others can learn from that and incorporate it into their own parenting or education system. So hopefully we'll become a not, you know, kind of a reason for folks to start rethinking how important it is for these kids to get out there and get their hands dirty and, and uh, experience nature. Experience the meaning of life. That's right. All right. Learn about the needs of, of animals and people. Or we're all the same in that regard. We have the needs of shelter, nutrition. you got to learn about this and respect it. And, and what I see right now, and, and in the wake of some of the recent events like in Nashville, you know, you just, the, the, the respect of other people, of other living things, seems to be gone. Well, you know, you and I have talked about this, Wayne, but I, I think really what we're dealing with now is the culmination of our society evolving to a point where we're squeezing out really critical elements of a healthy development. You know, no matter where you live, your income, urban, rural, we're, we're taking a lot of those elements out unconsciously and we're replacing it with a cell phone that's introducing a lot of noise right at that critical era. So to me, we've got to find things beyond just traditional answers in medicine and counseling. It's not enough. We're going to have to have some really serious wholesale rethinking because right now we're literally creating kids with mental health issues as fast as it's almost like a factory process. Very true. And we've got to make some fun, but we think in some small way, if we remind parents and educators and others that getting those kids outside, getting them doing some physical things, getting them away from their phone and isolation, they can make huge improvements almost overnight if we make that little correction. As you watch, especially kids, let's take 8, 9, 10, 12 years old, okay? Yeah. 
and you watch them on the cell phone texting and doing this and doing that, and they're all off in their own little world, okay? What's missing, and I, I was in sales for years, so what's missing is personal interaction. That's right. And that's what's missing. That's another piece that's getting seen. Because, you know, all of a sudden, all of these people, all of these events, they're not real. In their brain, they're not real, okay? And, and you can text and uh, somebody something and say anything you want, and you're not looking at them, and you're not going to get that response. But you know what's so surprising to me? And I guess, you know, Ben's Ranch Foundation is, is, is a reflection of my biases, so I'm just another parent. But kids that have come up in very difficult circumstances and in an era where the cell phone's about their only friend, when we get them outside and get them throwing a bale of hay or taking care of an animal or doing something that engages their senses, they turn around and improve. It flips overnight. Yeah, yeah, I it mean, flips it's so overnight. powerful. So it's good reason to think that there's we could be positive about how much we can reverse this trend if we'll just pay attention to some basics. And there's something else to this that, that works, and it works. Trust me. I've been out many a time on a sales call or whatever years ago, and you're talking with somebody and you touch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That little touch, like that. I yeah. love what you're saying. We'll find that little touch on the arm, that human connection, yeah. is worth millions of dollars. Well, let me. And say, your your electronic equipment does not give you. No, it doesn't. But let me also say too that I think we're created to be social creatures. We need network. We, we need, need interaction. We need to belong. We need to feel part of something. Yeah. And again. And I don't give myself credit. Some of these things are benefits I wouldn't have imagined, but when we get them out there taking care of an animal or interacting with new faces around them, new adults and stuff, and all of a sudden they feel like they're doing something important. Right. And they are. And that makes them feel better about themselves, but also they, they start to have an identity of, hey, I'm, I'm an important person, I'm doing something wonderful. And that kind of plugs in and starts to fill that need for social interaction, and human and real physical interaction with things and other beings. And so, you know, we're starting to talk to schools about how can we incorporate this into their routine because that's that's where it's got to be. It's got to be core to how we're all going to bring young people to a point where they self-launch, if you will, know, and they flourish. You know, how can we inject some nature, some physical, some social into their routine and 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 but when you look at that, you know, and and everybody has seen the the old movie Old Yeller. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have you guys seen Old Yeller? I have. All right. Because when the boy has to shoot his own dog because it's rabbit, okay, there's your life lesson. The life lesson is, you know, sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. But that animal is depending on you, so is everybody else. And sometimes those hard decisions are the only way out. But the bottom line is, you're out there with other people or with those animals making that decision. You know that their well-being depends on you. And you know that even though it was a hard thing to do, it was the right thing to do. Well, that example also underscores another thing you're touching, which is that it's real. Right, it's real. I mean, the thing that's so dangerous about our digital culture, if a lot of other things aren't in place, that serves as the surrogate or the substitute. It soaks up all the extra time and energy. And that is not real, what's going on on that screen, which is why we're seeing such suicide rates and a lot of, a lot of very direct uh, harm being done that points right to bullying, to uh, kids not feeling they can compete with beautiful pictures of their peers. It's 
it's a combination of kids getting more and more isolated because of this phenomenon and what fills that void is stuff that accelerates the problem because it's often a world that isn't physical, it's not something you smell or taste or experience or help with. And it's just, it's another world in your face. Already. And something else there that touches on that is the fact that we're not letting kids learn this stuff. We're, we're spending too much time guiding them along, yeah. and not letting, it's like a mouse in a maze. Like they we keep, have to fill all their available space with our ideas of, instead of letting them be kids or letting them learn. or Letting, letting them be kids. Them and you know what? Them. Then all of a sudden you've got, you've got a 20 year old adult that absolutely has no reasoning power. Because right. you've never let them reason. You know, some of this stuff is, you know, it's taken eons to develop. One of the, of the stats, Wayne, I see often, like coming back across it, and it always shocks me, is it something like 8% of our time is spent in, act, in interaction with the outdoors and nature, and the average human these days, 8% of their time, we're not too long ago when our dads and granddads were, were, were making a living. It was the polar opposite. It was like 10 or 15 percent were their whole life started and ended in the city. Um, but I think, you know, if we just get this job, urban garden sound and, you know, Dirty old beat up lots in the inner city can become gardens and, and places where it's green and kids can grow stuff. It's not that hard for us to reintroduce some of this. Now there are other variables in this whole equation that maybe you and I and, and this approach we take won't address, but this is a big one and it's, it's something that we can do almost anywhere and it's accessible and natural and affordable as opposed to big expensive hospitals and, and more traditional approaches. We've got to broaden the strategy. Once again, you just open a bigger hospital and you throw more drugs at them to control things. And that's all the money aspect of it, which really does not accomplish anything as far as what the problem really is. Well, it's reactionary, which is all of our medical system in the world. I, I've been part of it. I admire it. I'm thankful for the science. But as a society, we're almost always thinking of how to react to the worst case scenario after things are broken. And, and one of the things about Ben's Ranch is we're trying to get kids who are already in an almost impossible adolescent environment. I mean, if you're the healthiest kid on the planet, the best upbringing in the world, it's a gauntlet to get through your adolescent years right now, right? So if, if we think that a doctor or a diagnosis and a prescription is going to solve all this stuff, we believe those are beginners and, and necessary ingredients, but they're not enough. We, you, you only have to look at the kids we see every day who are going through the council, going through the doc's office, but something's missing in the strategy, you know, and there has to be, we have to think as a society that medical and counseling stuff is the start of it, not the end. You know, it's not, it's not the silver bullet. And that's why I say if we can get the dialogue around sort of a wholesale approach at every level, in our schools, at home, and so forth, that lets these kids get back to a more healthy set of experiences, I think we can do a lot of that. I mean, I, this is a very, very difficult crisis we're experiencing, but I don't think it's impossible to make some real headway. Well, it is a very real crisis, and it's getting worse every day. Yes. The problem we have is a lot of people, including me, don't really understand all the mistakes we've made to get here. Oh, we've made a bunch of mistakes, 
or we wouldn't be here. Well, and okay. count me in that group because Dan was my oldest son, and now when I think back at all the different chapters of his battle, the bipolar, um, could I do every bit of it, every little moment, much differently and better? Absolutely. And, and Wayne, you touched on something here I want to say as a message to, to parents out there. There's no playbook for dealing with one of your kids having a mental health issue. It's almost, it's dangerous for me to say it because I've had it in my family and I, it's almost more intuitive and, and, and easier for a parent to get their hands on something like cancer or an accident or something that's pretty straightforward to them. But when you start to have a mental health situation in your household, it's so unusual. It's so unpredictable. And there, it's di so different from family to family to family. Yeah. The, the things that happen. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up with this story. I'm gonna tie it back to the to the federal government. People complain and complain and complain. The government reacts so slowly. Okay. Something happens and they just there's just no action, no action, no action. That is by design and that is a very smart design. Because what you want to be able to do is sit down and address an issue and over a period of a year or two develop legislation that is well thought out and a wonderful action on the problem. If everything were a, an executive order, let's say, where it's a knee-jerk reaction, then all you wind up with is, with is a knee-jerk reaction that has other consequences you didn't think about, but you acted out of emotion, you didn't act out of logic. Well, and the federal government is a champion at doing that. Yeah, kind yeah, of stuff. and I, you know, as you know, I spent a lot of years in that arena, and so I'm, I couldn't agree with you more. But I will say this. We didn't create this epidemic overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. But I think bringing it to the forefront of our priority list is critical right now because in my humble view, the mental health epidemic among our youth makes COVID look like a walk in the park in terms of its long-term implications. Right. I mean, just think about our workforce. We don't have enough great talent out there at any level, in any industry, in any location now. But the stats on that, say in the next 10 years, that already predict it will become worse, don't uh, assume that at the same time we've got 20, 30, 40% of our future workforce that are heading for serious impairments or falling out of the workforce. In other words, it overstates the amount of folks we're going to be putting into the workplace out of our schools and makes the problem much worse. Now, I want to think of this as a more personal, much more empathetic thing than a government statistic. But my point is, this is a wholesale threat to our economy, to our society. Everything. It's big. And I think it demands more than just throwing a little more money at health clinics and stuff. And, and more power to it. Let's do all, everything we can. But it, we've got to have more innovation to, the, to really solve it. We've got to really think deeper and broader. And I hope our little tiny modest Ben's well, Ranch is at least sending a signal. I think it is. And I'll tell you, the one thing I will say about COVID is that I think we handled the whole thing horribly wrong. We made a gazillion mistakes. It was not the thing that they said it was. But here's what COVID did. Because we were doing a lot of knee-jerk reactions, and we were hiding in the closet and staying in the house, and did, but it has exposed a lot of other problems that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. It, and it's also opened up some doors to things like more flexible work environments and so on that might have some positive. But I will tell you this, while you're on the point, it also blew the lid off the mental health crisis a moment. That's what I mean. It's I mean, it, it, yeah, it accelerated it and and Which tenfold. exposed it more. Yeah. I mean, it's not good that it happened, but, yeah. you know, it brought, it, attention. it brought attention to certain things 
that you say you know family and we only want the best for them drinking no standing most water, water means clean no more good standing tasting, water algae Maximize free their mosquito free clean and virus free cool water, water. Every time they no go risk for a of drink. electric shock. Make no your risk choice. Of fire from faulty safe, wiring. Reliable. Cool water in the summer. Post. Warm water in the winter. Water delivered fresh from the water supply at 50 degrees year round. Drinking post water. We would like to introduce you to Orange Slow Feeders. Wonderful feeders, made in the USA. Very heavy construction, five to seven year life on these feeders, from small bales, trailer hanging bags, to large round bales, and many of your feeding solutions. Brian from Orange Slow Feeder says, check us out, orangeslowfeeder.com. The crisis is not going to get better without everybody getting into it. We got to get into it and solve it. It is a people mental health problem. It is not a problem of knives or guns or, or any animate object like that. It is a problem with people. And these people need help. We've created the mess, and we all need to pitch in now and try to fix it. And I commend you for what you're doing. Well, we're trying to make a little dent, and, and thank you for the chance to tell our story. No problem. Thank you. We're here at the Indiana Equine Roundup. Speaking of horses, Stay with us.